Today's message is titled, Here's Your Sign. There was a priest and a rabbi who had local parishes nearby, and they decided they were going to stand on the side of the road, and each one of them was holding up a sign. The rabbi's sign read, The end is near. And the priest's sign, who was on the other side of the road, said, Turn before it's too late. And of course, as cars passed by, they were able to read these signs. And one car passed and yelled at the man and said, Get a job, you loser. So he drove on by, and then shortly behind him was another one and said, Leave us alone, you bunch of religious freaks. And just a few minutes later, you could hear the screech of tires and then a crash of metal. And then a few seconds behind it was that second car, and you could hear the screech of tires and the sound of metal crunching. And the rabbi looked over at the priest and he said, you know, do you think we should try a different sign? And the priest responded and said, well, maybe perhaps the bridges out would have been a better choice. <laughs> As we've already seen in the early part of Mark chapter 13, we can misread signs. People do it all the time. So here's your sign today. Jesus has provided us with a very clear and concise message in our passage of Scripture that he wants us to pay attention to. So let us go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to dive right in because we've got a lot to cover. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the privilege and opportunity to gather into your house and just to thank you for being our Lord and Savior. And when we have a heart of gratitude, it enables us to worship you in the right spirit. We're not looking to get anything. We're looking to give all that we are in this act of worship today. As we study your word, Lord, speak to our hearts, clear our minds of any distractions, and let our hearts be solely focused on being obedient to what you call us to do and what you reveal to us in your word. I pray that we will always leave here different than when we came in because you are a transforming, loving God who is patient, but you're also a wrathful judging God. So I pray that we will see the signs and that we will heed the warnings and that we will be obedient to do what you call us to do. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be found acceptable in your sight. You're my Lord, my rock, my strength, and my redeemer. And I aim to please and please only you. So use me for your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to pick up in verse 14. Of Mark 13. So read along with me. It's also on the screen. And it says these words. When you see the abomination of desolation. Standing where it should not be. Let the reader understand. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. A man on the housetop must not come down. Or go in and get anything out of his house. And a man in the field must not go back to even get his coat. Woe to the pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. Pray it won't happen in winter. May God bless the reading of his word. This is one of the most difficult passages, this phrase, uh, these verses that we just looked at, if not in the New Testament, in the entire Bible. Because the phrase, the abomination of desolation, is a difficult one to understand if you don't understand the Old Testament prophecies. So this phrase comes from the book of Daniel, verse uh, Daniel chapter 9 primarily, but also in 11 and 12. And here's where it occurs those three times. Daniel 9, 27 says, He will make a firm covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to the sacrifice and offering, and the abomination of desolation will be on a wing of the temple until the decreed destruction is poured out on the desolator. Then in chapter 11, verse 31, it says, His force will rise up and desecrate the temple fortress. They will abolish at regular sacrifice and set up the abomination of desolation. Then in chapter 12, verse 11, From that time, the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up and there will be 1,290 days. Here Jesus connects this phrase with the meaning of the indescribable suffering tribulation the kind that hasn't been seen from the beginning of the world 
We see that in the next verse of verse 19. But the word abomination suggests that something that it's something that is offensive to God. While desolation implies that the temple will be left deserted, in other words, those who come to worship in the temple will no longer occupy it, but vacate it because of the abominations. So the first thing we see here in this passage is the coming of the abomination of desolation. It, it happens. The Jews were exiled in 167 BC after the temple was defiled by who? Does anybody know? King Antiochus IV, also known as Antiochus Epiphanes, mean, in his word, that word means illustrious. And he came into the temple and he sacrificed a pig and he poured pig's blood all over the altar. And if you know anything about the Jewish people, what do they consider a pig? Unclean animal. It was an abomination to the temple to do what Antiochus Epiphanes did. He desecrated the altar of burnt offering in that temple when he set up an altar to Zeus after defiling it with the pig. No Jewish worshiper would ever enter that temple again because they were vile and unclean. This act of idolatry also would insult and incense the Jewish people so much that it spurred them into the Maccabean revolt, which if you study their history, you will see a lot of things took place during that period of time. Well, Jesus made it clear that the fulfillment of this prophecy was not just restricted to the events in 167 BC. Some believe, as I do, that it was also referring to the events that would take place just a few years from when Jesus spoke them in AD 70. And we looked at a lot of those events last week in the first part of chapter 13. What happened in AD 70? Well, the Romans, they came in, they conquered the city, they entered the temple with their military flags, and they set them up as objects of worship because the king was considered, the Caesar was considered a god. So they were instructed to worship Caesar as God instead of God as our Lord and Savior. Yet there seems to be more to Jesus' statement here when he talks about the abomination of desolation. He could also have in mind a prophecy that would be filled in the end times, which we all know from studying the Bible, that the Antichrist will come. And perhaps the best solution to understand the abomination of desolation is to know that it has multiple fulfillments. It has a fulfillment in 167 BC. It has a fulfillment in 70 AD. And it will also be fulfilled in the end times when Jesus comes, his second coming, the advent that we look forward to that we celebrate this time of year. So the warning was then to those in Judea must flee to the mountains. That fits the, the context of it being for AD 70 because this was something that would be in their near future. The Roman army would, would bring about the fall of Jerusalem and no one would be able to flee from the judgment of God during the end times. So they wouldn't be able to flee if it wasn't referencing the Romans. So that makes more sense as we reference it to the Romans. And there's two key warnings in these verses. It says, first, a man on the housetop must not go down or go in to get anything out of his house. We all know that the roofs in Palestine were flat, right? We, we read passage after passage, which says it, it, it's, it's a place where they went for refuge. It's a place where they went for rest. It's a place where they went for the cool of the evening to be away from the indoors of the, of the home. And they were flat. And they were used as places of prayer as well. But in order to get onto the roof, you had to go outside the home and up a set of stairs on the outside to get up there. So what Jesus is saying here is it's going to be such an urgent time for you to escape. You won't have a lot of time. You can't even go down those stairs into your house to grab anything. You need to get off that roof as quick as you can and flee. Because destruction is coming. Desolation is is coming. Once they were down the staircase, they have to keep on going. And I believe Jesus used hyperbole here, a deliberate overstatement for the effect to make the point. Time is of the essence. Do not delay for any reason. Secondly, we see a man in the field must not go back to get his coat. The coat was an essential garment in the ancient world because it would be hot in the day and cool in the evening and when you were outdoors and sleeping outdoors, if you didn't have a coat, you could possibly freeze to death. So it was a very important article of clothing. 
So in the daytime, you would take it off and you would be able to work and you'd have the freedom of movement. But in the nighttime, you would bundle up in that coat, much like we do when we go camping with a sleeping bag. Well, Jesus instructed the people, they shouldn't even go back into their house to get their coat. They should head to the mountains immediately. Get out of the field. Get out into hiding. Because this crisis will take precedence over any comfort you can find from that coat. Then in verses 17 and 18, Jesus emphasized the winter season would be an especially hard and difficult time to flee. Why? Because of the cold and also the swollen rivers and streams would prevent great hazards and they would slow down the opportunity for you to escape. The phrase pregnant women and nursing mothers indicate that women who are pregnant or with small children would have a hard time getting away because of their condition. They can't move as fast. They can't flee as quick. So being able to cover ground quickly was of the utmost importance. And these warnings were especially appropriate because of what actually happened in Jerusalem. The Romans came and they came in quick. They didn't have a slow uh, uh, journey to get there. They surrounded them. So in the light of these events of 167 BC and AD 70, we should anticipate that there's also going to be a climactic event of such horrible destruction and desecration just prior to our Lord's second coming. And Jesus is speaking of the eschatological end through the eyes of the imminent destruction that was before the Jewish people and his disciples in the temple. I don't believe the warnings of Mark 14, 14 through 18 apply to us today. But they do remind us that God's people in every age must take the prophetic word that we read in the scriptures and be prepared as they commanded them to be prepared to obey God at any time. Now, there's another passage of scripture in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where according to this passage, there will come a terrible antagonist. And he's known as a man of lawlessness who most scholars identify as the Antichrist. And he will come in some future time and he will unleash severe tribulation on the people of God, which will in turn usher the return of the Lord. And Mark relates this abominable event to the cryptically and suggestively uh, to the destruction of the temple. So in doing so, he imputes a couple of things, both a historical and an eschatological value to the same event. So this is kind of the hinge in Mark 13 that links these things in AD 70 to those days, meaning the end times. Let's move on to verse 19. It says, for those will be days of tribulation, the kind that hasn't been from the beginning of creation until now and never will be again. If the Lord had not cut those days short, no one would be saved. But he cut those days short for the sake of the elect whom he chose. If anyone tells you, see, here is the Messiah, see there, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will arise and will perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. And you must watch. I have told you everything in advance. So here we will see the coming of the false messiahs and prophets. The coming of false messiahs and prophets. These verses you see, a, 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 in my opinion, a shift from the immediate future of the Jewish people in AD 70 to the end times. A catastrophic and cataclysmic language seems to look forward to the great tribulation that would precede the end days. And Mark uses language derived from Daniel's description of the last days. And also Revelation 14, 19 gives us further details about the judgment and the wrath that will come from God when he pours out his wrath during the end times. Those days will be unequaled in all of human history. Indeed, no one will be delivered from death in those days if it were allowed to continue. But Mark's statement about the elect refers to God's people here, and God remembers his people. What does it say in Habakkuk 3.2? It says, even in the midst of wrath, God remembers mercy. So he's going to remember mercy in the midst of this tribulation to provide a way of salvation. And during the tribulation, God will judge the world and he will prepare Israel for the coming of the Messiah. And it will be a time of intense judgment and wrath being poured out on the world. 
like it's never seen before and never will see again, according to Jesus' own words. In it, God will be working out his purposes. He will be setting the stage for the coming conqueror, and then he will cut those days short, it says. That means he will limit his wrath to a point in time that God the Father has predetermined. And Jesus concludes this section just as it began, with a warning. He holds up a sign. He says, false messiahs and false prophets will be in your midst. Satanic deception will continue until the very end days. Count on it. <coughs> Excuse me. Count on it. It will come. You will see scenes of people performing signs and wonders that may even lead astray the elect. So deceptive will be these miracles that they'll be tempted to follow after them. We see it today, don't we? But Jesus warns us, and he warns his disciples. He says those miracles aren't proof of divinity. Those, those aren't proof of a divine calling. Those aren't proof of any of my approval that they can do these things. He says, you must watch. This is the third time that Jesus says that. Be on guard, be on watch, be aware. So I think we should pay attention, don't you? In fact, he concludes, I have told you everything in advance. So we've got all the information we need to be prepared for when those things happen. He says, don't be deceived by false teachers. Multiple times, Jesus has warned us that there will be false teachers. And they have a mission. Their mission is to lead God's people astray from the truth. Some of these people will be able to perform, quote unquote, miracles. And signs. And they will use those miracles and those signs to lead people astray. Since Jesus talked about it multiple times, I think again, anytime you see something repeated in scriptures, you need to pay attention when it's repeated. Because God knows how we work. We have to hear things over and over for it to sink in. So pay attention and watch out for these charlatans that claim to be messiahs and prophets. You know, this was originally addressed to the people in the first century. I realize that in the context, but we find plenty of false teachers today in the world in which we live in. For example, there's the prosperity gospel. If you follow after me and God, guess what? He's going to bless you with riches. All your financial problems will go away. No, they won't. It's not what the Bible teaches. It's very popular. People love hearing that message. It tickles their ears, doesn't it? But it's not true. Expect to be persecuted. That's what the Bible tells us. Expect to suffer. Expect to be betrayed. We don't follow Jesus to gain riches. But we receive them anyway, spiritual riches. We're called to follow and obey Jesus and to be saved from our sins. That's why we follow Jesus. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they're another false gospel that's out there. They claim that Jesus was not God. They claim that he didn't die for our sins. They claim that Jesus and Satan are brothers. That's a lie. It's not true. Don't be deceived. In many mainline denominations, you'll find people who hold a low view of the scriptures. They don't consider this Bible to be the inerrant, holy inspired word of God. I do. Jesus did. All the apostles did. In fact, they believed it to be so true they were willing to lay down their lives for it. All of them. And they died for the gospel. But some, they say, well, the Bible, it's, it's got some contradictions in it. There's, there's some things that just don't add up. And God, if God is love, then how can we do this? If, if these people live this way, then how can this be true about God? They love to say the Bible isn't accurate. They love to say it's not a reliable source of wisdom. You know, God, he, he, he loves everybody, right? So we've got to accept this homosexual lifestyle, right? That's not anywhere in the Bible. It's not there, folks. Stay away from people who do not follow the word of God. Stay away from people who try and twist and manipulate the scriptures to say something that it doesn't say. That's why you will always hear from me from this pulpit and anywhere else I ever preach. 
The word of God is wholly inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it is truth. It is accurate. It is infallible. And context determines meaning. And scripture interprets scripture, not culture. Amen. Scripture interprets scripture. So stay away from people who don't believe the word of God. And the best way we can avoid these false teachers, I've shared this illustration with you before. In the Secret Service, one of their jobs is to what? Detect counterfeit money. You know how they study counterfeit money? By examining and knowing the real currency. They spend weeks upon weeks examining every facet of the U.S. currency. Whether it be a dollar bill, a $20 bill, a $50 bill, or a $100 bill. They know how it feels. They know how it smells. They know what it looks like. They know the variance in colors. They know the little lines that are in the paper, the colored strands that are in the paper. They study the real thing. Because when they find a counterfeit, it jumps out at them because they know the real thing so well, they're not deceived. The same thing is true about the Word of God. If you don't know the Word of God, you are easily going to be deceived. Well, the, press, the pastor or the preacher said, the Word of God says so-and-so, so I believe it. Ah, don't fall for his lie. Know the Word of God. That's how you can fight back. That's how you can know the truth. Study and read the Bible. And go to a church that encourages that. Verse 24. But in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shed its light. The stars will be falling from the sky and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. He will send out the angels and he will gather the elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Here we will see the coming of the Son of Man. Oh, what a glorious day that will be. Jesus wanted to give his people hope. He's here telling them about all this destruction and the abomination of the desolation. And that there will be false prophets and false priests coming. And, and they will be lying to them. And it's going to be a time of, of severe persecution. He wanted to give them hope. He wanted to let them know that even though these tribulation times are going to be tough in the end days, there's hope. And he did so by describing his own return as being the conquering king of the cosmos. Amen. He's coming. That phrase in those days in verse 24 is an Old Testament expression referring to the end times. And we looked at, looked at it extensively as we've gone through the minor prophets as well as in Leviticus. When Jesus returns, folks. There is going to be a spectacular celestial phenomenon and cosmic disturbances the likes the world has never, ever experienced before and never will again. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not shed its light. The imagery of this language is similar to what we see in the Old Testament. The days of the Lord. Another phrase that the end times are near in the Old Testament. Judgment will certainly come. Jesus says in those days, what days? The days after the tribulation. After those days, cosmic and apocalyptic signs will occur. The sun will be darkened. The moon will shed its, not shed its light. The stars will be falling from the sky. The powers in the heavens will be shaken. Ultimate cosmic upheaval and universal cataclysmic judgment will signal that the end has come. We won't miss it. It won't be cloaked. It won't be a mystery. The world and everything in it, the universe and everything in it will be rocked and it will be shaken as God prepares to come in judgment in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. How did the stars fall from heaven to earth? Do any of us really know? No, we don't. We know some stars are bigger than our planet. Maybe this is going to be some meteor shower that comes. I don't know. But when Jesus comes, there's going to be stars falling from the sky. I do know it describes the powers of heaven beginning to shake as well. And it won't be just our planet shaking. Make sure you re recognize that. All the planets in the solar system and in the universe and in beyond what we don't even know exists, all of it will be shaking. Every planet will shake in fear as the creator of the universe and the judge of the universe is about to arrive. 
An interesting thought here is that this is the same Jesus who, when he came to earth on Christmas that we celebrate, he was completely veiled. He was God the Son, fully man, fully God, but he was veiled. So no one hardly recognized him apart from the miracles that he performed in a few key of his closest disciples. He sweat. He grew tired. He became hungry. He could feel pain. He understood heartache and loss. That was Jesus with his identity veiled. So he could identify completely with you and with me, and he would die for us so that we might find life. Well, guess what? At Jesus' second coming, his identity will not be veiled one iota. We will see Jesus fully. It will be revealed. Jesus' glory will be so awesome that it will dim the sun and the moon and the stars will fall and it will shake the planets. Oh, that's such a wonderful experience that we're going to be able to see. He saves us to adopt us into his family so that we won't suffer under this great tribulation. <clears throat> Revelation 6 also talks about these same events in verse 13 and 14. It says, The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its unripe figs. They were shaken by a high wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll being rolled up. And every mountain and island was moved from its place. Notice how this passage in Revelation describes the falling stars to the earth. Have any of you ever seen the mechanical way that they remove oranges from an orange tree? They shake it. And all of the fruit will fall into this tarp or basket and then they gather them up. That's what it's describing is going to happen to the stars of heaven. It's like a fig tree dropping its unripe figs. And it's going to happen at one time. And this is going to happen when Jesus comes. In addition, we're going to know that Jesus is about to arrive because when we look up, we're going to see the sky split apart. We're going to see it roll back like a scroll to make room for his coming. This is going to be an incredible moment. Even the mountains and the islands are going to be kicked out of the way. They're going to be scattered to make room for his arrival. Man, are you getting the idea of how awesome that Jesus is coming back is going to be? These are clear and unmistakable signs that Jesus is about to come. So don't be deceived. You've been warned. You've been given all that you need to know when it's going to happen. Isaiah, he says the same thing in chapter 13, verses 9 and 10. In the Old Testament, he says, look, the day of the Lord is coming. Cruel with fury and burning anger to make the earth a desolation and destroy its sinners. Indeed, the stars of the sky and its constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark when it rises and the moon will not shine. So the signs of Jesus' imminent arrival are the sun and moon are going to be dim. The meteors or the stars are going to fall from heaven all at once. The atmosphere of the earth is going to peel back and make a way. Mountains and islands are going to be kicked out of the way to make room for his coming. This is all before Jesus arrives, before he comes. Can you imagine when we see him in his full glory? When he's unveiled and we get to see him as he truly is in his glorified body? Man, these are the signs that we need to look for to know that Jesus is about to come. These are the signs which have been predicted by the prophets and they will prepare a way for his coming back to earth. It will be a revelation of his great glory as he comes to establish his rule on a new earth. The return of Jesus will not just be seen by a few people. It will be seen by everyone. Unlike when he came the first time. When he was placed in a manger and only a few saw him. Then, in verse 26, what a wonderful word of anticipation. They will see the Son of Man. This is that great eschatological figure described in Daniel. It says, he will be coming in the clouds with great power and glory. This is how Jesus went up at his ascension. And you remember what the angel said? What are you looking for? Jesus will return the same way in which he went up. And that's what this is saying. He's going to be coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And this is the first time that Jesus 
definitively is connected with the title, the Son of Man. And where does that come from? It comes from Daniel's prophecy. All of humankind will see the Son of Man as the ruler of the universe. When Jesus returns, it will be in the clouds with great power and glory. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. So if you're taking notes, I want you to circle a few words. Circle the words with great glory, uh, with great power and glory. That's the key. Because this is the summary of how we need to know that the end is near from his power and glory. And then the other phrase to circle is the Son of Man. In case there's any question of what Jesus meant when he talks about the Son of Man, let me explain it to you. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man 14 times. 14 times. It was his favorite self-designation and title. And it comes from Daniel 7, which talks about a person who is a human being, but is also a divine being who's given the title deed to the universe to reign over it for all eternity. So who is the Son of Man? Can anybody guess? It's when that Jesus answer works. Who's the Son of Man? Jesus. Who's the Son of Man? Jesus. Who's the Son of Man? Jesus. It's Jesus. That's right. He is the human being who is also fully God. And he's given the title deed of the universe by God the Father. Let me show you how I can say that with all assurance. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I continued watching in the night visions and suddenly one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven and he approached the ancient of days and was escorted before him. He was given dominion and glory and the kingdom so that those of every people, every nation and every language would serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. So if you have trusted in Jesus, if you believe in your heart, that his death on the cross paid for your sin, that he bought you out of the bondage of sin, and you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then he is not coming to judge you. He is coming to save you. He is coming to restore you. He is coming to bless you. Look what Jesus says will happen to those who know Jesus as their Savior. Verse 27. He will send out the angels who will harvest the work done by suffering saints who have what? Preach the gospel to all nations that we saw in verse 10 last week. We will face persecution. We know that. We saw that last week. We will face suffering. But God will use it to spread the gospel. He's going to send the angels. And as Christians, we should expect to suffer. We should be able to look forward to a time when that suffering will come to an end. And the world did not love Jesus, did it? So if it didn't love Jesus, Jesus says, don't expect it to love you. They will hate you because of your affiliation with my name. So if you claim to be a follower of Christ, the world will hate you. So expect persecution. Expect suffering. But God promises those hard times that we have in life will serve a purpose. Because it will allow the gospel to go forth. Do you know where the greatest persecution of Christians is taking place in the world today? China, where Lottie Moon gave her life. China is where the greatest persecution, you know where the church is growing the fastest in the world? China. That's how God works. That's how God works in hard times. is used as a platform to further the message through our life. So when our world seems to be falling apart, folks, it's not because God's lost control. It's because he's in control. He takes all things and uses it for his good and glory. Everything that happens to God's children happens for a purpose and for a reason. When we're persecuted, when we're arrested, when we're put in prison, God can use that to take us places that we would never go on our own. So we can meet people that we would never meet. So that we can take the gospel message to people that may have never heard it. I don't know what changes in your life God has made. I don't know what uh, you've had to face and what disasters have hit your life. I don't know how your life has been turned upside down, but I know how mine has been. And I can see God in it all the way. And he's taken me places I never would have gone. He's allowed me to talk to people that I never would have seen and been able to talk to. He's allowed me to share the gospel with people who never would have heard it had he not sent me. Here I am, Lord. Send me. That is my attitude now. Because I've seen him use me in the midst of somebody's worst time in their life. He's ordained it. 
and the gospel will be heard. So what will these angels do that come to gatherings? They will gather the elect from every corner of the globe and also in heaven. Revelation 7, 9, and 10 says, After I looked at this, there was a vast multitude of what? Every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. His major concern is to be to gather his people together so that we can share in this time of triumph. The phrase gather his elect from the four winds, from the four ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens has dual meaning for us. Not only will he send his angels to gather people from the ends of the earth, but he's also going to gather them from the heavens of the people that have gone before us. And we're going to be gathered together and celebrate his great triumph. Doesn't this cause your heart just to skip a beat? Doesn't it put a smile on your face to know that we will be with him in triumph? Man, think about the awesomeness of this moment. It just blows my mind to try and grasp it. You know, as I conclude, I just want to share that teaching the end times can both be troubling and also comforting at the same time. Because we need to know that we will suffer troubles and trials and tribulations in this world as Christians until Jesus comes again. That's troubling to some of us. But you know what? While we wait, while we expectantly wait for the second coming, the advent, we need to listen to what Jesus says rather than what people say. Because people want to lead you astray. So don't be surprised by catastrophes that take place in nature. Don't be surprised when we hear wars are taking place. Don't be surprised when you hear of suffering for God's people. But instead, realize that when Jesus talked about the future, his words are meant to change the way we live in the present. What did all the minor prophets say? Repent and return to me. Repent and return to me. His words are meant to change the way we live in the present. Don't be rebellious to God. Embrace God. Love God because he loves you. Repent and return. That's what the message is all about. Do as Paul encouraged in Titus 2.13. He said, look, there's a blessed hope and an appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do what John said in Revelation 22.20, 20, uh, 22, 20, where he says, and he prays, come, Lord Jesus, come. That's a great prayer to lift up. And as much as we watch and as we pray while we watch, be on guard. Don't worry about what's going to happen to you because it's going to be used by God for his glory. He will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus has already told us what to expect. He clearly and confidently and boldly declares that he is coming again and he will conquer and he is Lord of all and at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord and he's coming again to gather his elect from the four winds to the ends of the earth to the end of the sky so watch for it to happen to God be the glory for what he has done and what he will do pray with me Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this passage of scripture that excites my soul so much. Lord, I thank you for the warnings that you give, for the signs that are there. And I pray that we don't fall for the lies of the enemy. He loves to take a little bit of truth and twist it and pervert it. And he's done it with everything he's ever touched. I could go on and on about the things he's perverted. But Lord, I think we know because your word makes it clear. That if somebody does not teach the truth of the scriptures and they try to pervert it, they're a false prophet. Don't fall for it. Don't be deceived. And Lord, we thank you that you're coming to set us free one day. But you've already set us free from the bondage of sin because of what you did on the cross. And we have great freedom in Christ to worship you. No matter what happens to us physically, 
our souls are secure in your grip. So Lord, I pray that that encourages us to do what you've commanded us to do, to love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love others as we love ourselves. And if we do those two things, we fulfill the law. And if we uh, fulfill the law, that means we're obedient. If we're obedient to you, then we will fulfill the Great Commission, which tells us to go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them all of the scriptures. And the only way we can teach the scriptures is to know the scriptures and to study them and to have your spirit reveal to us and illuminate them to us. So Lord, I pray that even as we might be challenged today, that we would be encouraged to do what you've called us to do, to be obedient, to be faithful, to be loving, and to be transformed by the power of Jesus Christ and his gift to us, the Holy Spirit, so that we can worship the Father. It's in Jesus' name I pray today.